Hello, I'm Peter Whittle. Welcome to this week's show. Now, you might remember, because we've mentioned it quite a lot, that in October we had a special conference on immigration. Uh, I think the first uh, organisation to have such a conference in a very long time. And one of the most popular speeches was given by my guest today. Neil Anderson uh, is the director of a new campaign called End Mass Migration. And he finished off the conference and got a huge reception as a result. Um, thank you very much for coming, Neil. Um, end Mass Migration, pretty self-explanatory. But just, can you just tell us what you hope to achieve with this campaign? Well, first and foremost, as, you, as you've implied, it, you know, we do want to end mass migration. The scale of immigration now is completely um, yeah. unacceptable. You know, we have you know, 20, the year 2022, we had um, an increase in the population equivalent to a city the size of Sheffield. Um, you know, this is you know, part of an ongoing problem that's been going now for over two decades, but is really now reaching a scale um, that... Luckily, in some ways, you're starting to wake people up who've otherwise been somewhat complacent about. But we need to drive that home. Yeah. Um, and to do that, we cannot rely upon the political system and the political yeah. establishment to really do anything in order to address this. Now, yeah. what we've seen of late um, in terms of uh, the, the Conservative Party suddenly in desperation deciding to <clears throat> uh, try to push through policy to... Um, cut numbers, uh, inflows, uh, net, net inflow by about 300,000 um, is still going to leave us with immigration levels much, much higher than they've ever been historically. Mm. So this is not really something that now we can get complacent about and think that the government will address it, especially as this is a government that's very likely going to be voted out next year and replaced by a government that is unashamedly um, likely going to ramp up immigration again, regardless of what the Conservative Party now do. Um, so, you know, this is a, an, an existential problem facing our country. It's a, it's a problem that affects us economically, yeah. socially, culturally, in a massive way. And uh, you know, it has to end. So that is the primary aim. We would like to have, as part of this process, we think it's a good idea to drive a campaign for a referendum on migration right okay. um, to now the wording of that would have to be thrashed out precisely but simply we know that the public are largely um, uh, consistently showing in poll after poll that they want to see significant reductions in immigration um, and therefore a referendum would likely reflect public sentiment in a way that would bind government ideally in perpetuity to um, a sensible set of immigration controls and massive reductions in inflows. Mm. Um, but we also want to see the normalisation of the conversation around immigration. Now, of course, of late, we've had uh, the likes of Sweller Braverman talking much more openly on this. Um, and you know, there is some people sense that it is starting to become a more uh, an easier conversation to have. But I'm very sceptical about that. Mm. Um, we know that the media, the wider political establishment, academia are still very, very determined to drive immigration as high levels as possible. And the idea that they will um, allow a normalisation and an honest conversation around immigration to happen um, is very unlikely. Mm. So we want to, you know, open up that conversation and basically make it very clear that not only public sentiment on this, but that the, the levels of deception, the levels of um, obfuscation around it at an official level, the distortion of statistics, the manipulation of data, etc., that has not uh, in any criminal sense, but the, the, the sort of the, the decision to package data in certain ways to imply less of a problem in, um, emanating from immigration than has been, etc. All of these things need we need to be able to address. We need to have open and honest conversations about that. At the moment, really, is not possible, and there hasn't been for many, many years. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think over the past few days, even um, you mentioned there that some things can now be said or discussed, right? So, you know, they're always saying, it always tends to be a false dawn in, in the end. But I have noticed that, for example, even on the economic front now, there are these 
studies, I think is it Denmark has just done one, uh, which basically showed that there's not just no benefit from mass migration, but actually, uh, 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 you know, it, it, it is a debit situation, a deficit. Um, and um, I wondered, you know, th that does seem to be changing because always this kind of uh, argument was made, well, I tend to be more concerned with the cultural aspects of immigration, that it was an economic thing, but even that now is really being called seriously into question, is it? and you, you can call it into question. Yes, I mean, there's been, the economic argument has always been slightly more complex in terms of the immigration debate. Um, you know, it's, it's not so clean cut as the very clear and obvious uh, threats that mass immigration poses to our culture and mm. society and to our public services, pressure on infrastructure, etc. Um, you know, there are, there are, there have been multiple papers over the years showing that certainly immigration of low skilled people um, has kept a downward pressure on wages among the most vulnerable um, in society. This has been, you know, th this has been a consistent line from multiple papers produced by uh, the House of Lords Economic uh, Committee, the uh, Bank of England. This is not uh, a new uh, discovery. <laughs> mm. um, it's just been ignored, mm. of course. Um, you know, and something that m hopefully will emerge as there, maybe this opens up slightly is a willingness to look at how the economic contribution changes depending on the people who are coming in and where they're coming from. Yeah. You know, um, there is research that shows quite clearly that um, inflows of people from Western Europe and countries like America or Australia has a positive economic, um, makes a positive economic contribution. But on the other hand, we know that inflows from large swathes of Asia and Africa, for the most part, have a very detrimental mm. contribution. So when we talk about immigration through an economic prism, um, we need to break it down into a more granular analysis and show that actually, well, certain types of immigration actually can be, um, you know, have a net positive contribution to the economy. Um, but a significant, uh, by far a much bigger chunk of immigration from certainly from s certain parts of the world um, is negative. Mm. And, and, you know, in terms of not only in terms of its lack of economic productivity and its pressure on wages, but in terms of the cost to the, the British taxpayer in yeah. terms of um, benefits, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people make a net contribution, but the vast majority do not. Yes. And um, do you sense, I mean, we, we, I just said, you know, there are certain arguments which now are being made, but do you think that since, for example, you spoke at our conference, which was on the 7th of October, that was obviously the day that, you know, Hamas uh, basically attacked uh, Israel. Do you think that what we've seen since then has further woken people up about this? I think so. I mean, I certainly you know, know people who have expressed surprise at the reaction to um, what's going on. Yeah. Um, and these are people who are, for the most part, people I would consider to be quite well informed, quite you know, aware of what's going on. Mm. And yet, nonetheless, you know, have been very, very naive about um, the fact that when you allow vast numbers of people into your country from a, not only a completely different culture, but very many of them completely antagonistic and hateful towards your way of life mm. and your history, mm. then uh, you cannot be too surprised if then this manifests in very clear antagonism on, on our streets. Mm. All, all we're doing is taking the, the conflicts and antagonisms from the globe um, and transplanting them into our country. Yeah. And if you don't have a, a system whereby, A, you have much lower numbers that can over extended periods of time be reconciled to um, a sense of belonging in our culture, in our history, in our society, then, and there's no sense of, uh, there's no attempt whatsoever um, to obligate people mm. to have that sense of belonging, to feel that sense of belonging, to um, embrace what it means to become British, for mm. example, then obviously um, this is an inevitable outcome. Yeah, yeah. And the idea that we, you know, it's a great conceit of Western liberal democracy that in some way everyone just wants to be like us and if only we give them the opportunity to be mm. like us mm. and to come here that they will wholeheartedly embrace that. Now, obviously, time and time again, this is proven to be a completely mm. nonsensical mm. Uh, viewpoint, but it's nonetheless one that governments consistently seem to yeah. double down on. Um, 
you know, becoming a, 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 a citizen um, is something to be earned and it's a privilege to be earned. It's not something that should simply be transactional on the basis, oh, you have been here for a certain amount of time, mm. therefore mm. you are suddenly British because you have a document to show it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and this is something that we seem to have in the post-war liberal order in the West. And, uh, we seem to have forgotten, mm. um, much to our um, obviously, you know, much, you know, much to our regret now when we look at the consequences of that, although these consequences have been brewing for a very long time. With this, I, I just want to go back to this referendum point, because um, a lot of people that will, their ears will prick up at that, you know, we, we need a referendum. In fact, you, you hear about it, people saying this on social media uh, uh, now. Um, I know you, I'm not asking you to pin down words, but what would the broad gist of, of what would people be voting on in that? Well, ultimately, we need to have an immigration policy that is exclusively engineered towards our national interest. Right. And we should unashamedly have such a policy. Right. And so, obviously, national interest is a somewhat nebulous concept, and people will try to bring different interpretations of what that means. But ultimately, we need, you know, if we are to maintain social stability, security, and prosperity, mm -hmm then we cannot do so with immigration inflows uh, on, at the level they've been for the last 25 plus years. Mm. And so we need to have um, a, a, a commitment to, certainly on the short to medium term, massive reductions, if not essentially a near zero uh, immigration right. um, policy for a number of years simply in order to get a grip of the situation mm. that we are already dealing with domestically now. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, you can't deal with you know, the problem while, you've, while you're still adding mm. to the problem. Mm. Um, and so, you know, a, a referendum would have to take the lines of, in some way, a commitment by government to, you know, not only to massively reduce um, immigration, but to formulate a complete reformulation of our immigration policy a complete revision, you know, reimagination of yeah. our reimagining of our immigration policy that addresses, you know, the purpose of immigration. Mm -hmm. What is it supposed to achieve to our benefit? And every every aspect of it that is not to our benefit, we must excise from our immigration regime, and and we must be very willing to say, people, you know, from this country. They cannot come here unless, you know, for example, they've got a very particular skill set, you know, for a very particular requirement. Mm -hmm. But without the country becoming, as it has been for 20 years now, increasingly hooked on cheap labour and business essentially trying to drive um, an immigration agenda that serves its bottom line at the expense of, um, you know, the, the average yeah. person. Yeah. And, and so, you know, uh, f you know, a referendum on the basis of massive reductions, maybe even a moratorium on immigration for the foreseeable future, with the aim to then restructure the immigration system and re-envision it on very different lines. With a uh, moratorium, what kind of a time period do you think that might be? I mean, it's how long is a piece of string at the moment, but I know that the SDP, small party, is saying that we need a generational well, they call it a pause, right? And, you know, I wonder, is that the sort of thing you mean? Well, the thing is, I, we have to consider the fact that, as we touched upon earlier, there is some residual immigration that can be quite, low-level immigration, that can be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. There's no point turning away people with very high skills, very mm -hmm. particular skills mm -hmm. in, the, in engineering, in mathematics, etc., that will inevitably be of benefit to us. You know, this country has never closed its doors to immigration mm. completely. We have, however, we have never been a country of immigrants. Mm. Um, you know, there, there has always been some very low level of immigration, even in the pre-war centuries, you know, in, you know, going back you know, for, for millennia. But these numbers have been in the hundreds or sometimes in the thousands mm. rather than in the mm. hundreds of thousands that we're dealing with today. So, you know, the idea that we can... Um, close the doors indefinitely, of course, is, is not feasible. Mm -hmm. Realistically, if we could have a, mor a moratorium on certain types of immigration, mm -hmm. um, then 
you know, I, I see no problem with that lasting indefinitely. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we can't, there's no historical, there has been no historical necessity to have vast numbers of people coming into this country. There is no reason for it now other than the will of governments to uh, have perpetuated and driven this agenda. Mm. And it runs contrary to immigration into these islands for thousands of years. Mm. What we have seen in recent decades is completely and utterly different. Well, there's, yes, I mean, there's been this kind of um, Stalinist, uh, hasn't there, rewriting of history. So, you know, we've had Sadiq Khan saying London is, uh, was built by migrants and refugees. We've also had Generally, I mean, the great and the good of the institution saying that Britain's a nation of immigrants. Uh, it's just simply factually wrong. It's just factually wrong. That's before you even start looking at what their motives, motives might be. Um, we've got the referendum you want. Um, that obviously is, well, it's probably not unlike uh, people who were campaigning for Brexit. That, that, that's what ultimately you want. Um, there, I suppose there must be other things that you would, recommendations that you would like. Uh, to be seen put into practice as well. Well, certainly. I mean, what, yeah, none of this works without enforcement. Mm. And, none of, and, none, and enforcement doesn't work without the will to enforce. Mm. You know, in this country, we do have... Uh, the law is very clear around, for example, illegal immigration. Mm. Um, it's very clear, the 1971 Immigration Act, is very clear that if you arrive in the UK undocumented, you don't declare yourself, um, that is a criminal offence. And you are technically, you could go to prison, you, you could be fined. Um, we've decided to ignore all of this. Mm. You know, we don't use the law as it is. And then we have this performative activity around, for example, the Rwanda scheme, um, which is going to be completely ineffectual and quite pointless. Um, and the fact is that we cannot have um, any uh, change of immigration policy without the will to back it up. And the will is absent, and it, all, and it has been absent for a very long time. You know, the, the illegal immigration situation, for example, you know, it's not difficult as an island nation to keep people away. Mm. It's very simple. Mm. The reason we don't is because there is no will to do so. Mm. If we wanted to, we could. Mm. Um, the fact that when people do arrive, they, uh, it's so easy for them to disappear, there's no real will to enforce, to tr track people down, yeah. to uh, find absconders and deport them. None of this is happening. So the problem is that on paper, you can have the best immigration system in the world, but if you don't have the political will mm. to actually enforce that system, then it's pointless. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is part of the problem with what we're seeing at the moment, for example. You know, not only is the Rwanda plan in and of itself futile. <laughs> um, and we should, by the way, will... say that we're recording this on the very day that they're going to be debating this in Parliament, there might be re revolt about this. But frankly, what you're, you're saying is that, you know, it, it's, it's rubbish anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, what, yeah, what, yeah, you know, yeah. why do we need to have yeah. this, this very convoluted yeah. system in place um, at huge cost to mm -hmm. the taxpayer mm -hmm. um, to sort of essentially, uh, ultimately on the long term, an attempt to dissuade people from coming, mm -hmm. which is it's very highly unlikely to do for the most part. And... You know, when we don't, we can stop those people coming in the first place. I mean, this is the, this is the big issue here. Yeah, you yeah. know, and we, we, we tie ourselves in knots around the UN Refugee Convention, around ECHR. Um, you know, the UN Refugee Convention was written at a time in, in a very different period when, you know, we, in the post-war period when you'd had huge movements of people around Europe and the sense that we need systems in place and agreements in place to be able to support people who are forced from their homes mm. um, in circumstances beyond their control. Um, you know, and that was in a, an age before you know, mass transportation allowed huge numbers of people from you know, anywhere in the world to descend wherever they wanted to. Mm. Um, and, you know, we can't, we need to, you know, the, the UN Refugee Convention needs to be rewritten or completely dispensed with. Um, ECHR I mean, it's it's a bit of a joke that we're still beholden to mm. to this. Supposedly, you know, if Brexit was designed to restore sovereignty, but obviously we haven't actually restored sovereignty. Um, and so, you know, the government should be willing to just withdraw from you know, the ECHR and do what it needs to do to protect our sovereign national yeah. interest. Yeah. Government is getting itself in a mess, yeah. trying to avoid 
the only possible course, sensible course of action. Mm. Why not just withdraw from ECHR, have a much firmer line on these issues, and be willing to enforce them? The answer to that is, of course, there is no political will, really, to reduce immigration well, or enforce reduction. Well, there's no sort of will, but also it seems like there's a mixture of things, because on the one hand, you've got no will, as you say. On the other hand, you've got, uh, as we've seen in the past few years, border forces with, with remarkably kind of liberal attitudes to the whole idea of immigration. Why they're even in that kind of job, God only knows. Um, but at the same time, one of the big arguments, of course, is that this has managed, you know, this is used by government to completely obscure the extent of the problems that we have, you know, structurally and everything. And you can see that there's logic in that, can't you? I mean, that's why there's the so-called addiction. Absolutely. So, you know, we have our productivity, um, you know, output, pro worker productivity in the UK has been appalling for the last yeah, yeah. 20 or so years. It's making uptick in recent, recently um, in manufacturing, strangely, but um, for the most part, you know, it's running at about half the level it was before the age of mass immigration. Now, there are many factors playing into that, but one is quite obviously that when you're you know, bringing huge numbers of you know, people in to do uh, low-paid, low-skilled jobs, it, it, there's no requirement to innovate or yeah, yeah. Um, change your, the way you operate as an organisation, as a company. Um, and that builds in very profound structural inefficiencies. Um, we also have you know, specific uh, aspects of, uh, the, of, of the state that are increasingly reliant upon inflows of people, either as workers in the case, for example, of the NHS, where, you know, and you often hear this retort from the pro-immigration, we are, but, you know, what, we won't have any doctors or nurses. Well... <laughs> We can train our own doctors and nurses. Historically, we always did that. Mm. This is not a, mm. you know, insurmountable problem. Mm. Um, Jer when Jeremy Hunt was the health secretary, in fact, he announced a massive expansion of doctor training places, which obviously never materialised anywhere near the way it was uh, yeah, it yeah. said that it, that it would, um, in order to reduce our dependence on foreign doctors. And if you look at countries in Europe, um, the, the reliance upon foreign doctors, for the most part, is significantly lower than it is here. So that's no denigration of foreign doctors per se, but it's simply we have a lot of people perfectly skilled, perfectly capable who want mm. to study medicine and become doctors in the UK. We should be enabling that mm. rather than looking for the short term option. Oh, it will save us money on training. We'll just bring people over <coughs> with their families, with all of the um, uh, the, pre the added pressure on society that that brings. Mm. And so. You know, and we've got higher education is a, is a very another example, completely different once again, where, you know, I mean, in the last in the figures that have come out recently, you know, we we know that uh, something shy of 40 percent, just shy of 40 percent of um, migration last net net migration in 2022 was of overseas students, primarily from uh, India and Nigeria. Um, this. You know, why do we have an, a higher education system that seems to increasingly become has become dependent on mm. funding via this mechanism of importing large numbers of students rather than focusing on what it actually should be focusing on, which is you know, um, the teaching of UK nationals, of course, but also you know, giving us a, a good grounding in the, the key areas that we need for a modern, advanced, knowledge-based mm -hmm. economy. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, the, the, they've become a business. They've shifted into a business orientation, which is not their purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and they survived perfectly well prior to this age of you know, mass uh, student numbers from overseas. And we have to think about what that does to the experience of UK students going to university. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, there's in so many areas, there is an increasing, there's a sort of, it's almost like a, the, 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 certain sectors and, and big business have simply become hooked mm. on immigration. Mm. And like a junkie, they can't get mm. themselves off. Yeah. And this is, you know, it's unsustainable. And, you know, the idea, the counter argument, oh, well, a lot of these students will go home. Well, a lot of them will. But firstly, the old, the, 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 the regime for students was tightened up. Um, a few years ago, it was then liberalised again under Boris Johnson. 
which said, you know, who said basically that we can allow people to come, they can study, and then they can stay for a couple of years. Um, and if they find work, they can then obviously mm, potentially mm. stay longer. For a lot of these people, that's obviously what they're coming to do. They're not necessarily interested in acquiring a UK qualification in order to go back to their home country. It's a way in. Mm, mm. And once they're in, they're going to do everything they possibly can to stay. And also something which actually occurred uh, recently, which people would seem genuinely unaware. As you say, people who are quite switched on, very unaware that, uh, in fact, students and care workers can bring relatives. And in fact, they... they particularly with students, I believe, made up a huge proportion, actually, of, of people coming in. What's interesting about what your campaign, and, and generally now, is that it seems that the kind of focus on the boats and on illegal migration, which of course is incredibly important, incredibly important, nevertheless, the far bigger problem actually is legal migration, which is what you are actually addressing. Um, I mean, can I ask, why, why did you start it? You know, I mean, you might say, well, it seems obvious, but you know, many people are incredibly angry, particularly about this issue, but what, what made you start it? Why you? Well, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, there is some very sterling work on this um, by academics. Um, I mean, most notably, Matthew Goodwin and Eric Kaufman have, have written some excellent stuff on this in recent years and are continuing to produce phenomenally good output. Um, and you know, Migration Watch have been very, uh, you know, they've been active in this area for two decades. Because you, you were and director of Migration Watch, weren't you, for a while? I, I was, yes. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, however, that the, coming in from the sort of academic perspective or coming in from the think tank perspective doesn't really... Um, galvanise action. It doesn't really encourage people to look at this in ways that they can actually do something about it. So we can bemoan the problem and we can dissect the problem and we can produce all the data that we want about the problem. We know the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and this data is all very useful. It's very helpful to make the arguments. But fundamentally, it doesn't change anything on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a parliamentary system that is, you know, large, you know, the vast majority of parliamentarians have no interest in addressing this issue whatsoever, especially in our two-party system, nothing will change. Mm. And so the only way you can try to affect change in some way is through more of a grassroots approach to this. Mm. And the aim is, you know, this has got off the ground, it's, it's developing uh, you know, quite slowly at the moment, but the plan is into next year to be able to actually go to certain areas, particularly with high levels of immigration, mm -hmm. and to um, you know, have people out you know, talking to the public, getting into, you know, posting literature to people, making people recognise that, A, there is an organisation out there that is determined to address this, and making the, the argument that while people complacently believe that we have to accept the uh, this this very negative two-party mm. system that we have where people are voting for one party largely in order to keep the other out rather than for anything positive they're mm. offering um, and the recognition that you know Labour Conservatives the Liberal Democrats the Green Party especially those four are all completely mm. essentially you know, are keen on maintaining massive levels of immigration mm. that Actually, we need to make people recognise that you, know, you, you can choose <laughs> yeah, yeah, to yeah. go for something else, to push for something else. You can make it known to your parliamentarians and you can withhold your support from your parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. And really, we want people to be thinking in that way. Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's, and when you look at immigration and the scale, not only the scale of immigration and the, the fact that both major parties and some smaller parties have very similar views on it, mm -hmm. um, and they are completely indifferent to public concern on this. And the fact that immigration has such a negative impact on so many areas of our life in this country, you know, whether it's on pressure on health care, pressure on housing. Um, and if we can get people to therefore recognise that through the prism of immigration and considering so many other areas of political life in our country and, and government policy, through the prism of immigration, we can actually use that as a 
as a as a lever to say, well, you're not getting my support mm. because mm. you're not addressing this fundamental issue from which so many yes. other problems stem. Yes. And y- that can only come from grassroots activity. It yes. can only come from galvanizing people and giving them a channel for this frustration, mm. for their anger um, that they feel about seeing their country completely um, changed um, actively undermined and destroyed in many cases, mm. and particularly in the big cities, mm. um, by a contemptuous political class that has no interest whatsoever in uh, changing its stance on immigration. So through the immigration argument, we can drive a lot of other... Yeah, we can drive positive change. Oh, yes. I mean, I just wonder, you personally, how has your life, say, for example, been affected by mass immigration do you think well i was brought up in east london and i've seen changes in you know, my uh you know my local area and my community largely not for the better mm-hmm. over you know the last 40 or so years um you know i've seen that firsthand and i you know and i have very clear memories of you know in the 1990s of you know being in school and you know the school would welcome you know quite hard line Islamist preachers to, to talk mm. to Muslim students in what they call the, the Muslim Assembly, for example. Um, and there was a sort of complacency around this. Mm. So th- this was all uh, taking off after the Yugoslav War, yeah. um, when obviously this sort of um, started to embed itself more deeply in, in, in the UK. But that's just one example of how you're thinking, hold on, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a, you know, what I consider to be an English school. Yeah. In, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm now getting exposed to basically being told that Western education is evil and, uh, mm. you know, unless I adopt, you know, uh, um, you know, embrace a, another uh, world view, then I, you know, that, that I'm going to face damnation, etc. Mm. And, you know, this is something that, you know, this was happening nearly, you know, 30 years ago and no one really paid any attention to, but it was going on and it was, you know, these things were, that's just one example, mm. but it's just an example of how, if you have no will to retain a national culture and consolidate a national culture, mm. and if you have no will politically to, um, to, to encourage a commonality and a recognition of, the, of a, a common point from where we have come mm. and a common sense of where we are going, then you start to get a fragmentation of society. Mm. Now, no one in the 1990s could have dreamed that we'd be seeing these levels of immigration mm. today. And mm. this was happening before Tony Blair and before mm. the age of mass immigration. Mm. Mm. So this, this slow deconstruction of British history and culture is not a, you know, and this denigration of it is certainly not a new thing. I mean, obviously, you know, you've, you've, you know, uh, you've published books on mm. this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, over time, when areas become... You know, the, the inability just to be able to talk to a neighbour, for example. Mm. These things are not small things. These are significant things. Mm. When someone doesn't have, you know, any ability, no points of reference, you have no common points of reference whatsoever. And that's OK when, you know, you're talking about a handful of people out of a significant number. But when you're starting to talk about the scale mm. of change, mm. when you're talking about entire areas over the space of 20 or so years, changing from predominantly a sort of monocultural to multicultural, multilingual. This fragments all of the trappings yeah. and cohesion that yeah. once was so important. Mm. And we let it go. And it's mm. very, very hard, if not impossible, to recover. You will, uh, you will with your campaign, sort of like gearing up next year, right? So you will really, you know, get a lot of opposition, won't you? Oh, of course. Yeah, and you're quite you're prepared for that. Well, I think you know it's uh, in a way getting opposition is good because it yeah. means that you're you yeah. know, you're you're making your presence known. Yeah, yeah. But it's also um, it, you know it's obviously it's inevitable. Mm. The problem is that a lot of the opposition will not be reasonable. It mm. will not be grounded in wanting to sit down and have a debate. Mm, mm. And I would happily sit down and have a debate with anyone who they wants don't to want have to debate, debate. either. But no one wants that conversation, no, of no, course. No. They don't want the conversation because the only way to sustain their fabric mm, of mm. mythology and lies that defend the mass immigration direction mm. that we have taken as a country mm. is to not actually have an honest conversation. Mm. Because an honest conversation will 
you know, it will fall apart instantly. How would people become involved in, in this, uh, Neil? How, how can people, you know, how can they get involved? Well, I've had lots and lots of people um, emailing um, f through the website. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the website is, we'll put the underneath this video, but what, where yes, would they Yes, it's endmassmigration.uk. .uk. Um, and there's been very significant expressions of interest from people all over the country. Um, on this, um, willing, offering their help either, some people just wanting to be on the, our mailing list, yeah. um, we're going to start sending out sort of monthly newsletters, etc. Um, and over time, start directing people towards where there's going to be activities and things like this that we can uh, sort of, you know, that we intend to coordinate, etc. But, um, you know, simply going onto the website and emailing us, especially if people can offer help either just, you know, mm. on the streets, um, you know, uh, or more technical help or legal help mm. or anything like that. Mm. It would all be, it's all useful and uh, something that we would be very grateful for, of course. Um, so I mean, when I say it started slowly, it's not that there's the numbers of, it's not that there's been little interest. It's yeah. been simply that we're not, we haven't started actively doing mm. uh, much at the moment. I mean, it only kicked off a couple of months ago. Yeah. And we're just sort of finding out really where to um you know, looking at the lie of the land yes. at the moment, politically, yeah. everything up in the air, particularly now with this Conservative Party in complete meltdown and, you know, the mm. way they're looking at immigration policy. It's very hard at the moment to even fix yourself on, a, mm. <laughs> on something in the, in, the, in the bigger picture because mm. God knows what the policy will be tomorrow. Um, yes. So basically, uh, with that in mind, that people can contact you via, your, via the website, mmassmigration.uk. Yes. Yeah. They can email directly from that. You also, because you know that uh, you also contributed State of Emergency is our latest book, A Voice for the Silence, Silence Majority. That's the new, new Culture Forum's new book. Um, Neil has an essay um, all about ending mass migration. It's one of our 10 pledges that we want candidates to uh, respond to, should we put it like that, um, in the election year next year, whenever that is, uh, whenever it's going to come up. Um, but Yours is a great essay in here, uh, Neil. So it's in this book too, uh, Neil Anderson and Mass Migration. Um, Neil, would you stay um, and just answer a few questions, special questions for our members? We have exclusive, uh, you know, material for our, for our members, um, if you wouldn't mind. But um, for the time being anyway, thanks very, very much. And, and also all the very, very best. I mean, I... I the majority of the country will be behind you in this campaign, actually. So thank you very much, uh, Neil, for that. Um, we shall see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.